As you can see on the screen, today's title is Risen with Christ, and looking at a true pursuit of the reward. And Paul spent a significant amount of time to this point talking about the importance of being rooted in Christ. And as he's done so, he's given the warning and the concern of putting our roots into things other than the things of Christ, things that were incomplete in their manifestation of the Lord Jesus Christ. Just consider, for example, some of the things from chapter 2 that he outlined for us. For example, circumcision. If you were to summarize each of these elements with one key phrase on what the issue, what the shortcoming was as it pertained to their approach, circumcision was reduced to external action without internal change. Doing things without really thinking about the meaning. Focusing on the external elements of the law without driving in internal change. Rituals, doing the motions, but missing the meaning. And asceticism, rigorous self-denial, leading to prideful self-promotion. In each case, he went through and showed how this incomplete element could be contrasted with the fullness that was available in Christ. For example, with circumcision, the complete fulfillment wasn't just the cutting off of an external peace in the part of the Lord Jesus Christ, but it was the putting off of the body of the flesh, the entire body. In himself, he destroyed it on the cross, the power of sin, by never giving into it in his life. In regards to rituals, the complete image was the sense that rituals were an imperfect foreshadow, but the body itself could be seen with Christ, the three-dimensional object, the image of the Father could be seen in the Word made flesh as they looked at everything that Jesus said, everything that Jesus did, and they could see the perfect manifestation of the Father. And in regards to asceticism, this rigorous self-denial leading to a prideful self-promotion, pride disconnects us from the head. The body becomes disconnected from the head, and we have to increase instead with a godly increase, continuing to reach out to the Lord Jesus Christ such that we might be the functioning body of Christ, doing the will of the head, doing the will that he would like us to perform in our lives. Well, Paul has shown them effectively what not to do, which is helpful, but if somebody comes to us with a list of all the things that we are not to do, it could leave us questioning, well, what exactly are we supposed to do then? Now that I've seen all the things I shouldn't be doing, help me understand what I should do, therefore. And Paul is going to do exactly that in our class today. In fact, he's going to model it after the advice of the Lord Jesus Christ in what Jesus tells Peter in Matthew chapter 16. Of when Jesus tells Peter, after Peter has told him, you don't need to do this, the Lord Jesus Christ says to Peter, you do not savor the things that be of God, but the things that be of men. If any man will come after me, let him deny himself, take up his cross, and follow me. And this is the pattern that's established here, these three steps of discipleship. Paul has identified very clearly the issue for them, that they were savoring the things that were of men and not the things that were of God, that man's definition of service is merely external and ineffectual in creating real transformation, real change. And if they wanted to move forward and find a solution to this issue, they needed to deny themselves. To not confuse asceticism with true self-denial, which had no value in stopping the indulgence of the flesh, but to truly deny themselves to put that way of life to death on the cross, to take up their cross, to mortify the members of the old man that he'll talk about in Colossians 3, verses 1 to 9. And finally, to follow me, to put on the new man, as he says in Colossians 3, verses 10 to 17. That will be our outline for the class as we go through it, to see what it really means to follow after Christ. Well, let's begin then with this portion of denying himself. If we take a look at Colossians 2 and verse 20, he says, if you were dead from the rudiments of the world, why then, why as though living in the world, are ye subject to ordinances, touch not, taste not, handle not? All these things perish with the use, but they're powerless. They're actually powerless in effecting real change. They were seeking justification through their works. But the danger 
is that these things can actually have an appearance of being a just and righteous disciple. Take a look at some of the descriptors that Paul uses here to illustrate the danger in this approach. There's a show of wisdom. It looks wise to a casual onlooker. It's will worship. It's self-made religion, as the ESV says, because what we do is we take our rituals, the things that we do, and we substitute those for righteousness, when in reality, the things that we do are supposed to create the environment, as we covered yesterday, for being able to go through a transformation, to go through a change. But because we've changed the criteria of success to simply doing out of ritual, without thought, perhaps, he says that's a self-made religion because we've redefined success, and it's no longer the definition that God uses for success. He talks about humility, only an outward appearance, that it looks to be very pious to others, and a neglecting of the body, this asceticism, extreme self-denial that looks very disciplined, of where somebody, perhaps us, lives a very disciplined lifestyle, but in reality isn't moving any closer toward the kingdom. Because as the ESV renders it, they are of no value in stopping the indulgence of the flesh. And so what Paul is telling them here is that their whole approach to the truth was a complete miss. So is self-denial a bad thing then? Is self-discipline a bad thing? Because that's what asceticism is. It's extreme self-denial. Well, well no, self-discipline is important. But what is that self-discipline working toward? Is it the promotion of self so that I can show that if I try hard enough, I can make it? Or is it so that we can redefine our lives based on the things of Christ? This would have been a pretty stark realization for the Colossian believers. And it can be a pretty stark realization for us as we think and reflect on what areas of our lives we might be completely missing the mark. I already shared at the beginning of the week that that was a bit of our feeling as we sat in the parking lot and as we saw the boat leaving us. This is the actual boat that left us behind. And this is the empty parking lot with nobody there except for one seagull. This was a pretty stark realization when we showed up and realized we weren't on the boat that everyone else was and it was pulling away with us still at the dock. Well, what about us? What are we focused on? What are we trying to really accomplish? And you think about how we define success in our lives. Being scholarly is not the same as being godly. Studying a lot doesn't equate us to being a godly individual. It's a necessary input, but it doesn't actually make us godly. And being crazy busy all the time doesn't necessarily mean that we're doing the right things and the truth. Sometimes we define success that the busier I am, the more I'm running around doing ecclesial activities, the closer I am to God. Well, it is good to be involved in the truth. It is good to be busy, but we can never confuse activity with productivity. What are those things actually working toward in our lives? Are we using the busyness of the truth in a way that's purposeful to actually move ourselves, our families, and our ecclesias toward the kingdom? And are we joyful in our attitude when we're involved? Do we do it with the right spirit, or do we view it with the spirit of asceticism, of self-denial, of a sacrifice. I'm making a sacrifice for Christ today because I'm serving my brethren, because I'm doing this ecclesial activity, because I'm arranging this function. Or is it the joyful spirit that Paul demonstrates here of where he's joying on behalf of his brethren? Those are the things to begin to think about in our minds. That's Paul's challenging us with. Let him deny himself. That's true self-denial, is going down this pathway to make sure that we're not missing the mark. A self-display of all that we do without a real focus on who we are is the worry that Paul has for the Colossian believers. And so what then? What are they supposed to be doing given the fact that Paul has lovingly brought these concerns to them? Well, in Colossians 3, he instructs them of the need to take up their cross if ye then be risen with Christ, seek those things which are above, 
where Christ sitteth on the right hand of God. How simple, yet how profound are those words. If you're a member of the body and you find yourself disconnected from the head, you are not connected any longer to Christ, you feel that your life is out of sorts, that you're moving further and further away, or you've been walking for a period of time in the truth and you look back only to realize that the distance between where you want to be and where you are is vast. How do you find the head as a member of the body? Paul says, look up. Look up, that's where the head is. Look up, seek those things that are above. And that word seek is a word that means to search with the intent to find. There's a zeal behind that searching. I'm sure that as many of us are parents said, having instructed our children when they're getting ready to, for school or perhaps something this week, have told them to go find a pair of pants or a shirt to put on. And they seek those things for maybe 15 to 20 seconds and come back and I can't find it, only to realize it's on the top of the pile right where we told them that it was. That's not the type of seeking that we're talking about, right? We're supposed to seek it as hidden treasure, is what uh, Solomon tells us in, in the book of Proverbs, that those things are buried as hidden treasure, that we are to look for them. And to have that zeal in how we seek to not become discouraged, but to keep looking, to keep searching. And he says in verse 2, to set your affection on the things that are above. To set your mind is what that word affection means. To set our mind on the things above, that even though we have trials in front of our face, to focus through those trials to see beyond the temporal to the eternal and to try to quell and silence the noise that's so pervasive in our daily lives to set our minds on those things that are above, allowing us to look through faith to see what could be and not necessarily what is. Not those things that are on the earth. And he'll define what those things are that are on the earth in verse five, as we'll see in a couple moments. But it's like the man who buried his talent in the earth. I've often thought that that man was just somebody who was indolent, lazy, didn't do anything. And yes, that's what the Lord calls him, but was this man not an industrious man? He invested in the things of the earth, such that when the Lord returned expecting to see an increase pertaining to the things of the kingdom of heaven, there was nothing. All he could do was return the talents, the opportunities, the abilities that God had given him to work toward the kingdom with no increase because he had invested in the things of the earth. What is our anxiety over? What is our stress over? Where do our thoughts go as we questioned yesterday? Are they the things of the earth or the things that are above? Self needed to be put to death as Paul instructs them in verses three and four. For ye are dead. You're dead. You've put those things to death and your life is hid with Christ in God. When Christ, who is our life, shall appear, then shall ye also appear with him in glory. He's telling them that the time for glorification is in the future. The time for promotion is later. The cross must come before the crown. And yes, we will be glorified to God's honor, but that will be in the future. And so he's instructing them that their glory is hid with Christ. Their life is hid with Christ, and that Christ will bring their citizenship when he returns from heaven. And the goal, therefore, of the present life is not for us to appear righteous to others, but our goal is to show that God is righteous. And there's a big difference between these two statements as they pertain to how we act in our lives. Because if our goal is to show other people that we are great Christadelphians, that we are great believers in Christ, it will drive a different mode of behavior of casually mentioning our involvement in different functions, of making sure that perhaps in a non-obtrusive way that we're able to show how involved we are, how much time we've spent studying, the fact that, well, I just happened to visit so-and-so on my way home from work because they weren't feeling well. The end result of that perhaps is not glorification to God, but a promotion of self in a very subtle way. Whereas if our true intent is to show the righteousness of God, what does that look like when we come across conflict in the ecclesia? When our child is involved in a dispute with somebody else's? Does it mean that we want to show some way that our child is right in that situation because our child is a reflection of us 
And if our child is wrong, that means we are wrong and we begin to go down this discussion pathway and we find that our pride gets in the way of helping us to see that maybe there's something there that we can apologize for. Because when we admit that we are wrong, we are actually admitting that God is right. And through the admission of God being right, we can actually promote God as being right as opposed to us. I'm sure that we can think of a lot of practical examples of what this actually looks like in daily life. But this is one of the key elements that Paul is trying to get the Colossians and us through the Spirit to realize that this is what it means to put the old way of life to death. And this is what he says exactly in verse 5, where we are to mortify our members which are upon the earth. He says, I'm going to explain to you now what these members actually are. Those things that are on the earth that I mentioned to you back in verse 2. Well, he's going to explain what those are. Because he says these other things at the end of chapter 2 are powerless in regards to changing the indulgences of the flesh. You're focused on all these external elements of cutting off all these things outside of you. Don't do this. Don't eat that. Don't touch that. Don't say that. While it is important to demonstrate holiness on the outside, He says that needs to come from a separation and a transformation on the inside. And he uses this word members, which is talking about body parts. So one of the teens asked me, well, since he's talking about body parts and we're all members of the body, is he talking about cutting off other people? And while that is easier for us to figure out who we're going to vote off the island, so to speak, that's really not what Paul's talking about. He's talking about directing that internally in the spirit in which the Lord Jesus Christ uses it, in Matthew chapter 5 and verse 29, when Jesus talks about removing body parts, about plucking out our eye or chopping off our hand if they offend us. This is self-inflicted. It's looking inside of ourselves. And the reason that he uses that word members is to show that he's not talking about something like a hangnail, something that's superficial, He's talking about things that are deep-rooted inside of us that are going to be painful to change. Character flaws, deficiencies as they pertain to our walk in the truth that are well-developed over time. And he lists some of those members, some of these limbs of the human body, as we can see here. He mentions and begins with fornication. The Greek word is pornea, illicit sexual intercourse. And you think about this word pornea, and it has a very similar ring to pornography. Graphy is a word that actually means image. And when you think about this wording and what it actually means, we're talking about fornication images. And what that does is it calibrates our mind to how God sees those things. Because we can approach things in our life without the same level of clarity that God has But these things are fornication images. And whether we act out the fornication physically or in our minds, the warning that Paul is saying here is that we are compromising and jeopardizing our position in the kingdom. Are a few seconds of sensual pleasure worth turning in for eternity in the kingdom? Is what Paul is challenging us with here. To think about that in that regard He goes on to talk about uncleanness, a state of being separated from God, resulting from ungodliness. Inordinate affection, pathos, which are lusts that have developed into passionate desires. And then he says evil concupiscence, or evil lusts or desires, the source of sin. And so the source of sin, the lust that we have, develops into these inordinate affections, these lusts that have developed into passionate desires. And then he goes all the way back to covetousness, a greedy desire to have more. And he makes this startling statement that puts covetousness perhaps in a different light to how we're used to considering it, which is that it's idolatry, that covetousness is idolatry. And we wonder, well, how exactly is covetousness idolatry? Well, covetousness is when we want something that we don't have. And the scriptures talk about different ways that this can be manifested. For example, back in Exodus 20 and verse 17, or Deuteronomy 5 and verse 21, it talks about not coveting another spouse, 
not covering their job or their ox, their car, their donkey, you know, their form of transportation. It all begins to look like something of where we have a desire for something that doesn't belong to us. And what we're told in Ephesians 5 and verse 5 is that those who covet will actually find themselves not in the kingdom. And so as the Colossians were reading their letter, and then they got the letter from the Laodiceans and they would read Ephesians 5 and verse 5, they would see what other kind of characteristics covetousness was being coupled with. Thieves, drunkards, fornicators, homosexuals. And we may not view covetousness with this level of severity, but why does God? Well, you think about what this does, is it puts something into our mind, we allow something into our mind of where we want something we don't have. And as we begin to think about what we don't have and we desire that, it supplants our desire for the kingdom. And time and effort that we could be spending thinking about the things of God, we instead spend thinking about something that we don't have. We may think, well, if I pursue that and I pursue the kingdom and those things are aligned, then all is good. But what happens when the fork comes in the road and we're forced to make a decision on what we're truly going to pursue? Do we start compromising the things of the truth to pursue that desire of our heart, the thing that we're coveting after? Or do we leave those things behind? Because that forms idolatry. And idolatry is when we put something else before God. And so Paul is going to cover later that the antidote to covetousness is actually thankfulness when we begin to look at the new man. And we'll cover that in some level of detail. But I began to wonder, why did Paul cover them in this order? And this is simply a suggestion for why Paul may have done them in this order. But if you notice, the problem with the Colossians is that they focused on the external things, the things that they could see as being a criteria for success. But Paul is focusing on a number of things that can't be seen. So if you look at the critical element, the critical element, if we were to put them in reverse order, is covetousness. It's very difficult to see covetousness, isn't it? That's something that's within our hearts, something that we desire. Above this line are things that are externally visible, above the surface of the ground. And below this line are things that are externally hidden, yet visible to God. It all starts with desiring something we don't have, which leads us down a pathway away from God. And so if we continue down this pathway, this covetousness, a desire for something we don't have, a want, begins to develop into a lust. Lust of the eyes, lust of the flesh, the pride of life. And if we allow that lust to grow and to develop, we find that it turns into this desire that consumes us and grows and pervades our life to where we think of nothing else besides this desire. And that leads to an uncleanness, just like the Lord Jesus Christ said, that if we look on a woman and desire her in our hearts, then we have committed adultery. And we can do the same thing with desiring things, desiring something else besides what we have, insert whatever it is that's our particular struggle. And finally, finally it's manifested in what can be seen externally, the actual fornication. And Paul begins this list with what can be seen externally, but he's saying you need to dig way deeper than that. Because by the time that something can be seen externally, there's a raging infection that's rampant inside the body. And if you're not getting back to the root of the problem, then you're stopping way short of actually dealing with the issue. It's like one of these trees if it had a disease and we simply cut off the leaves that were showing the manifestation of the disease. You need to treat the tree itself to be able to heal the tree of the disease. And in like fashion, Paul says we need to get to the core of the issue if we're going to deal with the problem that we have before us. He continues on to talk about other attributes associated with the old man that would keep them out of the kingdom, that would push them down the wrong path. He talks about children of disobedience in verse 6. And that word for disobedience is actually unbelief. It's what's used in Hebrews 4, verses 6 and 11, as the thing that kept the children of Israel out of the kingdom, that they perished because of unbelief, because they didn't really believe what God had told them. If we really believe it, 
We're going to do it in our lives. And we know that to be the case, but sometimes our actions say otherwise, as we've already spoken about this week. He mentions anger, which is a vengeful wrath meted out against another. He mentions wrath, which is anger that boils over into unrestrained rage. Malice, which is ill will, the desire to harm or hurt someone else. And so instead of having positive intent toward our brethren, we have evil intent toward our brethren. A desire in our heart almost like Job's friends. We all associate with Job, but how many of us associate with Job's friends? We can all identify when others have not been helpful to us, but what about when we perhaps have found ourselves unwittingly perhaps in that situation? Filthy communication, blasphemy, lies, speaking injurious things about others, foul speaking, dirty jokes, crass innuendo, speaking things that aren't true. These are all elements that Paul counsels to be aware of. And if you were to bucket some of these, you could see that one of them, malice, deals with the intent of our heart. Two of these deal with emotion, anger, and wrath. And three of these deal with the things that we speak and the way that we communicate. And it's almost as though you start internally with what our intention is toward others. And the way that our intention is revealed is through our emotions. And the way that we communicate our emotions is through the things that we say, the things that we do. And it's almost like this shockwave emanating outward that grows exponentially over time. And when something is constrained or dwells within our hearts, we ourselves are poisoned, but perhaps the impact isn't felt by others. But unchecked, it continues to grow as we manifest it without even realizing it, in our emotion, our attitude toward others, and the things that we say, such that as we hurl this verbal shrapnel out of our mouths, that not just the recipient, but all around, become impacted by its effects. And so Paul speaks about these things, our intent, our emotions, and the things that we say as needing to be transformed. Words to live by are spoken in Psalm 101 and verse 3. I will put no wicked thing before mine eyes. I hate the work of them that turn aside. It shall not cleave to me. And Jesenia says that word for cleave actually means to be glued to. And so if we think about our lives, we think about the elements of the old man, as uncomfortable as that may be, what are the things that we are still glued to? in our lives, that we haven't quite become unstuck from. It can be painful to rip apart two things that are glued together. In fact, in Genesis chapter 2, when a man is told to cleave to his wife, and they shall become one flesh, it's the same Hebrew word that's used in Psalm 101 and verse 3. So whatever it is that we are glued to is what we will become. And so it's important for us to identify those elements in our lives so that we don't become those things and so that we can remove them. Well, having helped the Colossians look into the mirror of self-examination, he's left them perhaps feeling a bit low. And sometimes we can feel the same way, having looked into the mirror of self-examination and seen things that we're not very pleased with seeing can promote feelings of anxiety and despair, like where do I even go now? Yes, we've heard the counsel that I need to look up, that I need to seek those things that are above, but Paul has continued to talk about what it means to take up the cross. Well, now he's going to transition in verse 10 to discuss what it means to follow me, to transform, because now in verse 10, he introduces this new concept of putting on the new which is renewed in knowledge after the image of him that created him. The Colossians has thought a lot about what they put into their mouths, the things that they had done externally. And now Paul is saying that you need to put on the new. And the new, in verse 10, is going to be renewed in knowledge. That word for renew actually means to cause, to grow up. And it's the same sentiment that's expressed over in 2 Corinthians chapter 4 and verse 16, that though the outward man perish, the old man perish, the inward man is renewed day by day, that we are growing up into the head, that each and every day as we try to put the flesh to death, 
We are growing little by little, trying to be deliberate and intentional about turning into new people. And now what Paul's going to do, which is actually rather masterful, is through the Spirit he will demonstrate the different parts of the body that he feels are essential for them to build up capability in and to develop if they are truly going to become a new creation. Because the way that they are going to grow in verse 10 is to be renewed, to grow in knowledge after the image of him that created him. And this harkens back to Colossians 1 and verse 15. The Lord Jesus Christ was the image of the invisible God. In like fashion, we are expected to become the image of the invisible God by developing the characteristics of the Lord Jesus Christ. Take a look at this. As we try to develop this image, he's introduced the head as being Christ in Colossians 1 and verse 18 and Colossians 2 and verse 19. One of the initial things that he begins to talk about in verse 12 is the need for us to put on the bowels of mercies, kindness, humbleness of mind, meekness, long-suffering, forbearing one another, and forgiving one another. These elements of mercy, kindness, humility, meekness, patience, forbearance, and forgiveness. Quite often we focus on showing these things to each other, of showing kindness, of showing forgiveness, of demonstrating patience. But why is Paul talking about the bowels of these things? The Greek word is splakshuan, which actually literally means the bowels. Paul is saying that instead of just manifesting these things, these need to be core to who you are. You need to be merciful. You need to be kind. You need to be patient. Don't just focus on showing that, but you actually need to develop that as a part of who you are. Those need to be the defining characteristics of your character. And so when you look at the parable of the unforgiving servant in Matthew 18, the master, when he looks at that man who falls prostrate before him and says, Lord, give me time and I will repay thee all, it says that he was moved with compassion. It's a cognate of this word, splak nizomai, which means that the bowels are actually moved. It's like somebody reaches into the master into his gut and twist the gut like that feeling of when we've known that we've done the wrong thing and it just consumes us from our very core. We can feel it in our stomach. It brings us pain internally. And in the case of the Lord, he's driven as a result of that bodily reaction within him to want to show mercy, to want to show kindness, to want to show compassion, grace, forgiveness. Those are the elements that need to be an outworking of developing this internally within ourselves. He continues to go on and he says that above and beyond all of these characteristics, the most important thing that you need to develop is love. Because love, love is actually the bond in verse 14, the bond of perfectness. And that word, when you look it up in a lexicon, is actually used for ligaments. He talks about joints and ligaments that these are the ligaments of love. And if you think about a number of body parts, and you just take a bunch of bones and dump them together, that would accomplish nothing, right? It's just like what we were looking at last night with the chemistry reaction and putting in all the reactants and hoping that magically out comes this great result. No, actually, each of the body parts need to be put together and held together in a way that constrains them to function as one united whole. It's very similar to the concept that Paul expressed back in Colossians 2 and in verse 2 where he says being knit together in love, that word symbibazo, of being driven together, a force that drives them together. Because naturally the bones would want to come apart. The joints would want to come apart. But these ligaments hold the bones together when otherwise, naturally, they would fall to pieces. And anyone who's had a, a severed ligament a broken ligament can feel the effect of when a part of the body is not functioning properly. Love is essential if we are to work together as a united whole. It is the most important part, is what the Apostle Paul is telling us. We also continues on to talk about the heart in verse 15. And the heart within it, 
the peace of God needs to rule. And this word for rule is very similar to the word that's used in Colossians 2 and verse 18. Remember how yesterday we were talking about let no man, let no man in Colossians 2 and verse 18 beguile you of your reward. Three times that same Greek word was used to indicate don't let somebody else be your umpire in disqualifying you from the kingdom. Well, he says in contrast to allowing others to make us change our behavior, to compromise our reward, he says the thing that you should have as an umpire in your heart is the peace of God. Because when you think about the heart, the heart pumps life through the body. The life is in the blood. And as the blood with the nutrients and the oxygen flow through every member of the body, the body is infused with a life-giving substance that allows it to move. Now what happens when poison is injected into the heart? And it pumps that throughout the whole body. The whole body is therefore poisoned by whatever is in the heart. And so when we approach situations, he says, let the peace of God be the umpire, the determining factor on whatever course you decide to proceed down. That when you're making a decision, what will this decision result in? What will this course of action or this thing that I'm about to say, even though I may be saying it flippantly or jokingly, what will be the result of this? Will it result in the peace of God? Or will it result in poison spreading throughout the body? And he mentions in Colossians 3 and verse 16 that it is to be filled with thankfulness as well. As you continue reading on, he says that we are to be one body, a reminder that our calling as believers is to be one body. And that inside of us, once again inside, not external, but inside, the word of God needs to be taking up residence that it needs to be dwelling inside of us. And as they would try to comprehend these things in the letter that was sent to specifically to them, they would then begin to triangulate with the letter that was sent to the whole region. In Ephesians chapter 4, verses 15 to 16, rather speaking the truth in love, we are to grow up in every way into him who is the head, into Christ, growing up into the head, connecting to our Lord from whom the whole body joined and held together by every joint with which it is equipped, when each part is working properly, makes the body grow, so that it builds itself up in love. Every part of the body needs to be functioning correctly. Every member in this room, when we are working together, when we are motivated by the right spirit, when we are intentional about developing these characteristics within us, are part of that one body of Christ that helps us connect to the whole. Because the purpose of this body is that we will do the will of the head. And if we are not working together, how effectively will we be serving our head is the point that Paul is making. And we need to be developing these characteristics within us. This is the practical advice that he's counseling us on. And he says in chapter 3 and verse 15, and be ye thankful. And I want to spend a little bit of time on this aspect of thankfulness because of how important it is in helping us to become a new person. I believe that this is really a key in unlocking our potential as it pertains to becoming a new creation. And I'll explain why. This word thankful is an adjective, eucharistos, and it's the only time in the New Testament that it's used in the adjective form of being thankful. Every other time it's used to express thankfulness. And we can express thankfulness. We can say thank you. We can show it in our behavior. But Paul is saying you actually need to be thankful as a state of being, as a part of who you are. And what we find when we take a look at thankfulness is it's actually the antidote to covetousness. Paul developed this aspect of thankfulness or contentment independent of whatever circumstance he found himself in. We learn about this in Philippians 4 verses 11 to 13 because being thankful is one of perpetual thankfulness. It's not situationally dependent. Paul says in Philippians 4 verses 11 to 13, I have learned. Being thankful, being content is something that we have to learn. It takes time. It takes effort. 
And we may feel that at certain points in our lives that, yeah, I'm feeling pretty thankful. Things are going pretty good. It's been sunny all week. Kids aren't really sick. Having a good time. But what about when the situation changes? It's raining. Kids are sick. People are miserable. Food's gone bad. Whatever the case may be, the trials of life loom large. Are we still thankful? Paul is saying, no matter what state I am, I've learned to be content. I've learned to be thankful. And we tie thankfulness to the situation in life that we find ourselves in. And Paul says that we need to decouple these things, that we need to drop the meat cleaver, as it were, between those two elements, and to have them be mutually exclusive, that no matter what is going on in our life, that we still have this element of thankfulness dwelling within us. Now, how challenging is that? Sounds like a good theory, right? Be thankful all the time. It's great. That doesn't mean that we're just happy, clappy, going around with no worries, but that there's a state of contentment that comes from knowing and actually believing, as Paul tells us in Romans 8 and verse 28, that all things, that all things are working together for our eternal good, even when we can't see how, even when it's difficult, real time, to see how this will result in anything positive, to have the confidence that God is working his will in us. And knowing that this would be difficult, he counsels Timothy specifically in this regard in 1 Timothy 6, verses 6 through 12. And I'd like to just turn over there for a moment because we will just spend a couple minutes taking a look at this. 1 Timothy 6, verses 6 through 12. And I'll go ahead and uh, read these verses while we spend some time here. 1 Timothy 6 and verse 6. He's just concluded in verse 5 saying that some have supposed that gain is godliness, from such withdraw thyself. But godliness with contentment is great gain. For we brought nothing into this world, and it is certain we can carry nothing out. And having food and raiment, let us therewith, or be therewith, content. But they that will be rich fall into temptation and a snare, and into many foolish and hurtful lusts, which drown men in destruction and perdition. For the love of money is the root of all evil. And while some coveted after, they have erred from the faith and pierced themselves through with many sorrows. But thou, O man of God, flee these things, and follow after righteousness, godliness, faith, love, patience, meekness, Fight the good fight of faith. Lay hold on eternal life, whereunto thou art also called, and hast professed a good profession before many witnesses. Paul is, never, is telling Timothy to never pursue gain in this life. And what he does is he helps Timothy to first and foremost define success correctly. Godliness with contentment is success, not gain and godliness. Godliness with contentment, regardless of what is going on in our lives. And that comes from seeing this life for what it is. That this life is merely transience. That there's nothing permanent in this life other than what we are developing in regards to the mind of Christ. That's the only thing that will continue on, is what we've developed by God's grace and mercy of the mind of Christ. We brought nothing into this world and we can carry nothing out. And that will help us not pursue things in this life, to pursue prominence in this life, to pursue the things of this life because we know that they're going away. They're going to amount to nothing. And he tells Timothy one of the helpful things in this regard is to set your expectations correctly, to be content with the basic necessities of life in all circumstances. And quite often when we find ourselves disappointed, and we start peeling back, why are we disappointed? We find that we had certain expectations that weren't met. And what we find quite often in life is that our expectations tend to weigh us down rather than lift us up. And that we need to modify our expectations that no matter what happens in our lives, that God is at work, that God's plan and purpose is being fulfilled in us. And if we can change our expectations, if we can be content with the basic necessities of life, knowing that wherever we are lacking, Christ will supply the deficiency, then Paul is telling Timothy that will be extremely helpful for him. He tells him to pursue God's character and to flee from the pursuits of this life. The pursuits of this life 
or the deceitfulness of riches. Because we've all been told that we have certain inalienable rights. Life, liberty, the pursuit of happiness, whatever terminology you want to use for it. But the tragedy is, the very thing that people think is going to be an enabler for a better life, additional money, additional prominence, becomes the very tool that impales them with sorrow, tragedy, and anxiety, piercing themselves through with many sorrows. Because while pursuing happiness, this elusive grasping at the wind, people neglect the things that really matter, the things of truth, the things of substance, family, relationships, things that cannot be recovered once time is lost. And Paul is telling Timothy, those things are the deceitfulness of riches because while promising happiness, they only bring emptiness. Because what does it profit a man if he has gained the whole world and lost his own soul? And having come to that realization, he tells him to flee those things and instead to pursue godliness, to see them for what they are and to keep pressing forward with the confidence in God and in Christ. And as such, we define ourselves based on the commitment that we've made to Christ. Asking ourselves the question, who are we? What do we identify with? Do we identify with our profession? With our education? With our recreation? How do we identify ourselves? Where do we derive our feeling of importance? Is it from our relationship with Christ? Or is it something external to that? He tells Timothy to make sure that he's defining it correctly because if he does so, then he will be able to overcome this pitfall of covetousness. Thankfulness is the antidote to covetousness because we won't want more if we're thankful for what we have. But that's difficult. But the reality is we need to keep working toward it, to be thankful for what God has given to us knowing that he's given us what's sufficient to help us to the kingdom, to help us to succeed if we truly believe and press forward that we can do all things through Christ who strengthens us. So in verse 16, he continues on to instruct them. Now this is back in Colossians 3 and verse 16. So if you could just turn back there for a moment. Colossians 3 and verse 16 He says, let the word of Christ dwell in you richly with all wisdom, teaching and admonishing one another in psalms and hymns and spiritual songs, singing with grace or thankfulness in your hearts to the Lord. These are the two primary purposes of the ecclesia coming together, teaching the word of God to one another and showing thanks, showing its application through warning and through exhortation, of course in a way that edifies, teaching each other building each other up through exhortation, and the importance and the attitude as we do this, singing with grace, with thankfulness in our hearts, thinking about the words that we're singing and making sure that they have real impact. And as he says in verse 17, whatsoever ye do in word or deed, do all in the name of the Lord Jesus. This overarching emphasis that we need to do everything in the name of Jesus. What are the things that we should keep doing? What are the things that we should stop doing? What are the things as we look at our lives that we should not continue to say? What pitfalls are there that we need to change? How can we say that in all things we are doing them for Christ is the challenge that Paul is presenting to us associated with the new man. So as we seek to develop, to become the body of Christ, a body that is useful for his purpose, here are a few summary points to consider from today's class. If we want to transform, then we have to deny ourselves to take up our cross and to follow Jesus. But if we simply focus on external performance or external appearance, we'll find that we completely miss the mark. And as we seek to demonstrate Christ-like behavior, our emphasis has to be on showing that God is right. Not showing that we are right, but showing that God is right in all things. Which means that we have to dig deep to put to death 
our internal desires. And one body of Christ is only possible when all members are working to grow together. Which means in our lives we need to strive to eliminate covetousness by developing thankfulness. And if we continue to do this and to help each other to do this, then we'll find that we are able, by God's grace, to have Jesus take first place in our lives, giving thanks to God in everything, which doesn't mean that we will be perfect. It doesn't mean that we will never sin, but we will continue to press forward toward the mark above all else, reaching forth for the prize, trying to connect ourselves to the head, trying to connect to Christ in everything that we do.